in Israel about a month ago we were there and so Christina just as uh, we begin talking about our experiences how did we end up on a bus filled with 35 college kids in the middle of the Middle East watching uh, these historical places and visiting all these holy sites what was it all about why were we there how did we do it? It all started out when I lent my friend Ayatal Masson my genetics notes yeah, she told me about Passages, which is a program sponsored by the Museum of the Bible and the Philos Project in Washington, D.C., catered towards Christian college students who are interested in conducting a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. So that seemed to fit the bill for both of us, and as an all-expenses-paid scholarship, we signed up and conducted the interview, got the interviews conducted for us, and were accepted into the program. We're, we not only got to go to the place of Israel, which is considered a holy land and a holy site for so many, including us, get to see the place where the Christian faith was started, walk in Jesus' steps. We also experienced the modern day culture of Israel and got to meet with the Israelis, talk to them, see what their place is all about. As we were doing that, we also got to delve into the political situation and see firsthand, and not just on the news, not just what's fed to us, but see firsthand with our own eyes what's going on in the land of Israel. So our first impression of Israel, our first experience tasting Israel, actually happened before we even stepped foot in the country. It happened in Newark at the airport. The Joyzy. <laughs> at the Joyzy side. <laughs> And we were waiting in queue at the international terminal to catch the flight, the El Al flight, the Israeli airline. And just as any normal flight, we arrived there two hours early to get our bags checked. And there we were in line. And as five minutes turned into 10 minutes, turned into 15 minutes, we probably made only one foot, one step of progress. And it turned out that it took us three and a half hours just to get to be seen by an El Al uh, checked in, checked in, check in agent, and what was happening was actually that they were interviewing us to see if we were good to go, if we were cleared to go into the airplane. More like an interrogation, right? <laughs> actually, it turned out to be kind of like a 20-minute interrogation. Who are you? Where are you studying? What did you eat? <laughs> uh, did your mom, or did anybody check your bag for you? I was about to say that I checked my own bag just because I was afraid of the follow-up questions, but then... <laughs> I was thinking that that would probably be a lie because my mom helped me out and my hands were getting sweaty and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to let Christina do all the talking because she's good at that anyway. And yeah, it turned out we were good to go. We were clear. Yeah, yeah exactly. We were kind of scared about that. And we imagined, as uh, Dr. Eckelman said, you know, if this is what's happening before we even get to Israel with security, we don't even want to know how bad security is going to be once we get there. We're still in, in America, so they're questioning and interrogating us like this. And what's it going to be like when we get over there? But turns out, thank God, we were proven 
wrong. It was nothing like we would have imagined. And obviously we felt very safe in Israel, but we just had a wonderful, wonderful experience. It just took off from there. And if I had to pick one moment, there were so many fantastic experiences, but one moment that really defined the trip for me was visiting the Kotel or the Western Wall and just putting my hands there where the old temple once stood and saying a prayer, but also listening because it was a Friday night, a Friday evening, Shabbat, just before Shabbat, as many of you may know that it is a holy day of rest in the Jewish tradition and just listening to people singing songs, singing hymns, and there was actually a group of people just in a circle huddling and, and dancing, jumping up and down, and it was, it was like a party, and it was so heartwarming holy party. to see that. <laughs> and that very night, we had Shabbat with the Jewish-Israeli family. They're in Jerusalem, observant, observant uh, Hasidic family, and we also sang some Nigunim songs, which I don't know if you guys are familiar, familiar with that, but these are tunes that everybody knows the melody to. There are no words, and it kind of goes like, and it was just a night of fun and games, and it was truly, truly fantastic. Wonderful experience. But not always fun and games, as you may very well remember, and we'd like to share with you, there's also such a weight that we found out, a weight of responsibility for Israeli citizens. Although they live in a place that's thriving and has uh, so much fun and culture, there's also a very serious side to the situation in Israel. And we saw that by, by visiting uh, a village on the border with the Gaza Strip. Nativ HaAsada is the town where our tour guide, Praz, a Romanian Jew, Romanian descent, lives with his family. Now you'd think that by being on the border with the Gaza Strip, such, such tension that there is there, they'd be dying to get out, but actually he wants to stay there. Literally, just so you guys can get a picture, their community is on a hilltop and less than a mile away, you already see Gaza. There's a, a big concrete wall and then another metallic uh, electronic fence. And you can actually, if you look closely, you can see people on the other side of the strip. And it's so close, this interaction. They have an anti-sniper wall there, and at every 15 second sprint interval, there's a bomb shelter within this village. Every house has to have a bomb shelter. So at any given moment of the day, that alarm could go off, and people have to run to, ref to take refuge anywhere. Even the playgrounds have bomb shelters disguised as fun children's games, but the kids know that alarm goes off, they get into that caterpillar, because that caterpillar has cement, it has strongholds in it that will uh, not allow the bomb to, or the missile to get into, to, to attack them. Yeah. And we see that even despite the, all the odds, there is a, there's such thriving in the community. They paint the bomb shelters with bright colors and flowers, so it doesn't seem as though it's a war zone. It, you see children running around, you see families walking, and you see that they are not just surviving, but they are thriving in the midst of possible adversity. And one of uh, the phrases that our tour guide said, I'll never forget, is that our victory here in Israel is not attacking the other side or the other people who don't think like us, who don't practice our same religion and, and wishing their death or, or killing them, but is in fact in us living here, living normal lives and uh, pushing to have and striving to have that lifestyle. And that just made me think, people in Israel, you know, when we see the news, when we see what's going on there, we see a war zone and everything, they're just people like you and I. They're wanting to live normal, everyday lives, and that's their goal. And that really hit home to me. Yeah, we even thought, how could that pertain to us personally? And perhaps to even you personally as well. Perhaps there's a situation in your life where you're facing adversity, and everything seems to be going against you. You're having to swim against the flow. But you also, like what we witnessed in, in Israel, like many of, of those places, have to overcome that and are able to, and perhaps come out stronger because of it with research and development, with uh, bigger goals, with uh, more recognition than you had ever thought possible despite all the odds. With that being said, we got a real treat for you guys, a four minute video of our impressions of Israel. Just really sums up the places we've been to and all that good stuff and then we'll take questions afterwards. Sound like a plan? Sounds good. Yeah, great. All right. <laughs> Wow.
one brief word. Those of you who were here when both of them spoke may still remember me mentioning this, but when I first met both of them as well as the parents, they were rather tiny, yeah. unshy, <laughs> very respectful always, and then it took a long time before I saw them again, and uh, by, this, by this time James was already a grown man with beard and mustache. <laughs> And Christina, the same thing. And he was. That was right after his return from Germany, and I saw his video, and uh, we are so thrilled. And uh, this again uh, is a reflection of the good parents and the good home where they have been reared. And uh, the idea is always to advance, to move ahead, to move forward. Some of you may have recalled what I mentioned years ago to this very club, a motto that I adopted for my own self are words that I found in the diary of the medical doctor, explorer, and missionary, the late Dr. David Livingston, Livingston. one of the pioneers throughout the continent of Africa. And one entry at a given day was, I am prepared to go anywhere as long as it is forward. Wow. <laughs> Since I saw that, I said I have to adopt that as my own motto. And that's precisely what both of them are doing too, quite apart from even the knowledge of that entry from Livingston. But thank you both so much again. And I can assure you almost that this will not be the last time that you meet this group and others that may yet join us, because you know that there'll be new adventures and new things to report. So we're very grateful to you and for you both honoring us and for you, our guests.